last video, I talked about the experience of painting outside for 30 days in a row. If you missed it, I'll put the link in the description. But this video is going to be all about the logistics, my materials, some of the decisions I made along the way that made it a little bit easier, and techniques, and all sorts of other stuff. I'm going to be answering a lot of your questions that you've sent me over the last couple weeks, and hopefully by the end of this video you'll have lots of little tips that you can use yourself, but mostly I just hope you enjoy the video. And it's gonna be a long one, so grab some coffee or tea and get cozy. Let's get started. So if you have not watched the part one video and you have no idea what I'm talking about, the whole point of this project was to paint outside every day for 30 days. It's called the Plen April Challenge. I'll put the little hashtag on the screen and go search for that on social media or even Pinterest and you will find hundreds, maybe even thousands of amazing artists out there doing this challenge. Anyways, I knew I wanted to do it because first of all, I had just clawed my way out of creative burnout and I was dying to paint and especially to go outside because we had experienced a really rough winter. And April was honestly the perfect month to do this challenge because it is the strongest transition from season to season. April starts really snowy and ends warm and blossoms are everywhere, so it's a really amazing month. And I got to witness firsthand, up close, all of these amazing changes in the environment. And a lot of people ask me, why circles? <laughs> and why are they so small? Well, my answer may not be super satisfying because it was a spur of the moment decision. First of all, I knew I wanted to paint small because painting every single day outside is a challenge in itself and I didn't want to have each painting take like four hours. I knew I wanted to keep them small so I can keep them quick. And at first I was just going to tape off my page and do a few paintings per page and in the spur of the moment I grabbed my painter's tape and I traced a circle and it happens to be three inches diameter. And I was like, hmm, this is kind of like a little portal. And then I got this idea, like maybe I'll just have pages of all of these little portals and I can look back on them in the future and it'll transport me back to this moment. And so there you have it. There's the origin story of the circles. Someone asked, does painting in circles change how you approach composition? And for me, no, it doesn't matter what shape my canvas or my the area I'm painting in is. All that matters is creating a balance within the scene, within the painting. So if I'm working in a circle or an oval or a triangle, I just ignore the the shape of it and I think about what I'm actually including. Do I have a nice balance of lights and darks and can you tell what my focus is and you know just are things clear enough to understand? In the circles the hardest part was just staying within the circle shape like painting in a rounded way on the edges was a huge challenge. I have two main setups when I go outside to paint. One is the Etcher Slate Mini, and I've done a couple videos about how I use this, how I set it up, and all of the details if you're interested in that. Um, but this is the one that you see in the videos that opens up, and this is my little like drawing and plate painting platform. It's carried around by this strap, so it's just like a shoulder strap, and it attaches to a tripod with this little attachment under here. The second setup is my backpack, and I take this one out when I know I want to be doing photography as well. So I can fit my camera in here, I can fit my drone, all of my painting supplies, pretty much everything I need. And it has this little compartment. For my big lens. <laughs> So when I use this setup, I'm balancing everything on my lap when I paint. So it's not, 
ideal. It's also what I would take if I was going on like a big hike and I knew I would be bringing like lunch or a thermos of tea or something like that because it holds a lot more in here. But this is my favorite setup for drawing and painting outside because it just is so convenient to be hands-free. <laughs> I've shown this in other videos, but if you don't have a tripod, you can also use it hands-free like this. The shoulder strap is how it like attaches to you and you would fold that under. So you just clip that there. And now you have a nice little drawing platform but I always prefer to have it on a tripod because it's just so much more stable and convenient that way. <laughs> Besides my sketchbook, these that all fit in my hand were the materials I used. And we'll talk about the palette in a second. You don't really need that much. <laughs> so I have a pencil, a pen, a white Posca pen, which is what I use to outline my circles, one white tube of gouache and three brushes. A lot of people asked about the brushes <laughs> throughout the month and these white handle ones are the silver brand ultra mini lettering brushes which i had never heard of before but they have these really long soft golden taclon fibers and they are my absolute new favorite type of brush for gouache i also had one very tiny number two rigger brush it's like a very tiny script brush which i can get super thin lines with but otherwise that's it. I could just throw these in my pocket if I really wanted to and just grab my sketchbook and go out, uh, which I did a lot when I was just painting from home. I also kept a spray bottle with me because it's very nice to be able to mist your gouache palette uh, because it dries really fast in the sun and the wind. So now I'm gonna show you some clips of me using the materials and talk about them a little bit more and especially the palette. I think the thing I got the most questions about was my travel palette. Since I was using gouache, I needed something that was airtight and leak proof <laughs> and that I could just grab and go without a huge amount of fuss. And I have been using this particular palette for several months in and out of the studio and I've loved it. And this 30 day challenge just reinforced my love for this palette. There are two main challenges with a palette like this. One is that there's very little mixing space. So the lid opens up and that's what you mix on. And so you have to be very economical with your mixes or you have to clean them as it fills up and gets a little bit more muddy. However, I find that the, the mud or all of the grays that I create on the palette, the more I mix, are extremely valuable. And I use those random mixes all the time in my paintings. So, you know, it's, it's just part of the process. You learn how to do that. The other challenge is that as you're painting, you're kind of contaminating the various wells. So you get some blue inside the yellow and then the red. And by the end of the month, it was it was quite a mess. However, it didn't really affect my painting process throughout the month. If you watch me painting here, you can see that between mixes, I t my brush goes off to the right side of the camera. That's me dipping my brush in the water and cleaning it off. So pretty much every time I get a new color or add a new mix, I do that. And that really helps avoid that cross contamination of color. It's just part of the workflow and you, you get used to it after a few paintings. I did use fresh white for every single painting and that's true for my process no matter if I'm in the studio or outside. I just find that white is the most used color and I would much rather have clean, fresh, very creamy gouache to work with. It's not that the gouache in the palette gets stiff or anything, it actually stays very, very creamy, um, but I don't wanna worry about it getting contaminated or having to spritz it every once in a while, which slightly dilutes it. I need my white to be extremely opaque and very, very clean. So I always keep a tube of white in whatever bag I'm using, and I actually have multiple tubes of it because I, I don't ever wanna forget it. <laughs>
not a stranger to painting outside. I've been doing it since 2015. And I've lost count by now, but it's well over two or three hundred times. I've painted outside in every weather you can imagine. And you're probably like, why? <laughs> it's because I love being in nature. I love immersing myself in these amazing places. I feel like so many of my artist friends, if they lived here in Scotland where I live, they would be doing the same thing. No matter whether it's snowing or hailing or raining, you find a way. Whether it's umbrellas or finding shelter or painting from your car or just sucking it up and freezing your butt off and doing it fast. Oh my god! It's become part of me and I've never done it 30 days in a row until last month. And I wish I had done something like this sooner because I learned so much. I probably learned more about the process of painting outside in one month than I have in seven years. It's just nothing brings me more joy than painting outside. So I try to do it as often as possible. And it is a huge challenge when you're trying to learn the basics of painting, like how to mix color, how to see color, how to paint certain textures and all of that. I personally use several different mediums. I've painted with oils and acrylics and watercolor and gouache outside, and they all have their own challenges. But the one common denominator is that I'm in nature and that's what matters to me. So I'm very used to the challenges of painting in all sorts of weather. I bring lots of layers, hats, gloves, whatever. I always look at the forecast ahead of time so I kind of know what to expect, but it's Scotland and weather changes really fast. So over time I've just been really used to always bringing extra layers, hats, gloves, you name it. I always have extra stuff in my car. If I'm walking to my location, I try to layer up so that I can always just take some off if I need to, but it's better to be over prepared. And thankfully we don't get a ton of bugs here in Scotland. We do have one infamous creature called the midge, the midge, and those things are brutal. They come in swarms and they're so small you can barely see them and they just attack you and bite you and it stings and itches like crazy. They're like tiny versions of mosquitoes that move in huge swarms. So that part isn't fun and I do my best to avoid them. Sometimes I just can't paint where I wanna paint because of them. It is what it is. But that is a huge reason why I love painting outside when it's colder out because you don't have to deal with any bugs. Yes, you have other challenges, but it's so much better than being tortured by biting insects. I did not set a time limit for myself. I decided I would go into each moment, each experience with open mind and open time limit. I mean, some days I was in a bit of a hurry if I had a lot of errands to do or working on specific projects, but I tried <laughs> to be open. And what I found was that in general, each painting took me around 45 minutes to an hour on average. Some of them were faster, some were a little bit longer, but it's really rare for me to take longer than an hour on a painting this size. I could definitely tell by the end of the month my process was faster. And I don't know if that's just the subjects I was choosing or what it, maybe it was just me getting used to just a general workflow, but it was around 30 to 45 minutes towards the end of the month. Many people asked, how did you choose what to paint? And did you include everything you saw or did you eliminate or move things around as needed? Okay, so first of all, I always chose whatever jumped out at me in the moment. And that's gonna be different for everyone, obviously. Some days it was focused completely on beautiful light filtering through the scene. Other days I decided to study specific objects so I could learn how to paint them better and it really is different every day. Some days I decided to drive for 10 minutes without any clue where I was going, and then whenever I stopped, I would paint. So it really varied a lot each day. 
In terms of what I would include in my painting, because it's only three inches, I had to eliminate a lot of detail. I automatically had to focus on the bigger picture in a small form. <laughs> So let's take this scene for example, because I spent the most amount of time on this painting for the entire month. I did a lot of detail on this one. My first thought was, okay, I have all these different materials. I have brick, I have leaves and dirt and water. The first thing I would do is lay in a diluted underlayer so I have something to work on top of. Usually that first layer is kind of the local color, so it's not really the color I see reflected or there's not a lot of bounced light happening, it's just the color of the actual object, or at least as close as I could see it. Then I can slowly start to lay in shadows and define some of the forms and highlights and so on. It's just a very slow process of layering. And that's the reason I love gouache because you can use it watered down, you can use it thick. It's so versatile. Because I've been using it for so long now, the way my mind works is almost like I'm sculpting my painting. So I start with a very loose layer and then I slowly define the forms with thicker and thicker paint. One reason I really like painting with gouache on toned paper is that the paper itself is kind of like a mid-tone. So it automatically gets rid of that white that you would otherwise start with on bright white paper. And you can start with that as like your base color. So sometimes I will use that color of the paper to indicate highlights on objects. Other times I paint thickly on top of it. And as I'm explaining this, I'm <laughs> reminded how Every time I go out and paint, I try something new. So my process, my workflow is going to be different. And I can't explain one singular method for all subjects and all paintings. So I hope that the biggest lesson or the biggest takeaway from this is if you have a general workflow that works for you, start with that and keep developing it over time. Keep practicing, keep trying new things, and slowly that method will evolve and eventually it'll become something that works really well for a wider variety of scenes. In this particular scene, I had no idea how I was going to paint the water. I was staring down into this black void of water, but I could still see down a little bit and there were like leaves and stuff on the bottom of the pond. There were also reflections and there were floating leaves and other things on top of the surface. So, you know, that's so many layers of information. So the best I could do was to start with my base color, which was black, and then try <laughs> and fail and try again and fail and try again to add little bits of information in addition to that black. Did it work? I mean, the final result is a pond, but it could have been improved a lot. But I learned from that. And so next time I go out and I paint a pond, I'll have that much more information to work with. A lot of people asked me, how did I not get overwhelmed by all the information in front of me? Of course, as I said, having somewhat of a game plan is a good way to start. So sitting down, choosing a view, doing a quick little sketch, and just starting. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes starting is the hardest part. I can walk around for so long looking for the perfect scene, and I'll just keep going a little bit farther because I'm like, oh, I don't want to miss out on anything beautiful. But the thing that I learned by painting outside every single day, over and over and over, is that I can always go back. I mean, yeah, if you travel far away, you may not be able to go back to that spot, but it's better to just pick a spot, commit to it, and paint, because you're gonna enjoy it no matter what. Since I spent a lot of time exploring my neighborhood and nearby areas, I knew I could always go back. So I had a little bit less of that fear of missing out because I think that's something that stops a lot of people and it definitely stops me. Without the fear of missing out, you just sit there and you enjoy the moment and you paint whatever you can see. This scene in particular was extremely overwhelming to me. I honestly had no idea what I was doing the entire time. The only thing I was doing was relying on my past experiences. So 
building up the layers little by little. And the beauty of gouache is that you can continue to layer and layer and layer. And so if you get the color wrong on the first try, try again. Second layer, third layer, fourth layer, hopefully you get a little bit closer each time. And that's all learning is, trying over and over and over. Eventually certain things become second nature and other times you have to actively work on something. I do want to mention though that if you're brand new to painting and drawing, especially landscapes, it's so helpful to learn the fundamentals before you go outside because it can be very overwhelming out there. So finding like a beginner's course for just how to do the basics like drawing simple shapes, how to shade things, how to start seeing color or mixing color, that foundational work is going to be so important when you go out to paint. Otherwise it might feel like you're just shooting in the dark. And by the way, I do have lots of beginner classes. I'll put some links in the description in case you're curious. And I did mention in the last video that I recommend starting with simple sketches. So just a pencil and paper or a pen or whatever, and going out and just practicing drawing what you see, because that is going to be extremely important for all of your paintings in the future. Drawing is going to be the bones of your painting. So you need to have a good understanding of how to render things. And as you get a little more comfortable with that, you can start adding color, but just work in baby steps. When I first started painting outside, I was painting single objects. So like a single flower or a single tree, and it was overwhelming. And then as I slowly developed my eye and my hand-eye coordination and my understanding of how to draw and paint and everything, step by step, it got a little bit easier, a little bit better. And to me, the best feeling is when you're just immersed in nature and you connect with it on a deeper level by painting it. Maybe all this work sounds tedious, but it's not because along the way, you're still having fun in nature. And to me, the curiosity never ends. The excitement of learning and improving drives me forward constantly. And yes, I have frustrating days and I have paintings that I just want to throw away or burn, but I don't. I just move on. I learn from it and I move on. With my videos, I really want to encourage you to foster that curiosity and sense of wonder and knowing that every time you go out and paint and draw, you're going to learn something. So just do it a lot. Do it over and over. You'll get there. And I wish you the best of luck and joy out there. Thank you so much for watching. If I didn't answer your question or you have more questions, of course, leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them there. Otherwise, I will see you all again soon. Take care.